Hello, guys. Welcome Hi. to our panel, which will be talking about uh, diversity in creative spaces. And the title is indeed Increasing <laughs> Diversity in Creative Spaces. Um, here we have four very talented artists five. that I will be, five, well, okay, 4.5, <laughs> um, <laughs> that I will be interviewing and moderating uh, regarding that topic. Um, here we have Mia, uh, Lauren, Bree, and Eric, and they'll have their own introductions in a bit. But if you would like to start from the top Brie <laughs> um, okay. so you know like what do you do occupation you know type of work and projects or companies that you've worked for I've worked everywhere and anywhere no um hi my name is Brie and currently I am a color stylist at Netflix on the best show in the world but it's unannounced so I can't talk about it <laughs> um I so wait am I saying where I've worked so I've um I've actually been in the industry since 2018 I mean I kind of started a little bit earlier but I graduated in 2018 so since then, I've like hopped around Six Point Harness, Bento Box, Nickelodeon, and these are like short stints. Still, Six Point Harness was kind of like in the beginning the longest stint. Um, Sony Pictures, um, and then a lot of like a lot of that was also freelance, and then just like a lot of like quiet freelance on my own side. So, but currently, um, I'm also a colorist for DC Comics on the up and coming Nubia comic um so yeah that's me i do that <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> Vista, Vista, comic everything under the umbrella <laughs> yeah well i mean you know funny thing i wouldn't ca call myself a Vista artist anymore i think uh, the more i work professionally the more specific my skills have become definitely color character and costume are my my absolute joys yeah mm -hmm. yeah and Eric, what, are, what about you? Would you like your introduction? Yeah, hi, my name is Eric Wilkerson. Uh, I am a sci-fi fantasy illustrator. A uh, majority of my work is uh, aimed at like book covers, trading card art, uh, concept design for games, film, stuff like that. And so some of my clients have been Weta Workshop, uh, Marvel, DC, uh, Disney, Scholastic, Dark Horse, uh, Wizards of the Coast, stuff like that. Um, I I love sci-fi. I love painting like far off worlds and uh, stuff like that. And I have been really excited about putting people of color in those environments, in those in those illustrations, in those narrative moments, um, for for a long time, and it's only now I feel like it's being embraced. So that's that's where I'm at right now in my in my life and career. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, that's that's wonderful. It sounds like also it's a very it's been a very long process too. Yeah, I mean to get to a point where it didn't feel like a taboo to to put a brown person in my art you know i felt like if i did it i'd have to sneak them in or or something like that or uh somebody in the background or usually if you do see any personal color in a in sci-fi fantasy art that and it wasn't asked for they're in the background somewhere it's not a main character yeah. Uh, you know the story is not written around that person or even if it's the personal art of the artist they're not going out of their way to include that in their art so uh, I made it kind of my my thing to say all right well there's already a hundred guys already over here doing blonde hair blue-eyed lady with the sword and half naked fighting you know. <laughs> 
How is she not dead? My gosh. <laughs> right, right. All she's, of her vitals are not covered. I don't understand. All of her exactly. vitals are out. <laughs> I mean, she, she's got to be happy, right? I mean, that's that's just the thing. I don't know. I don't know why, but um, I always thought about uh, for, uh, what is it? The Lord of the Rings and all that stuff, and how the only dark-skinned people in that entire series are all like monsters worthy mm -hmm. of catching an arrow in the face yeah like oh so okay <laughs> like don't do that don't paint that right? <laughs> there's already enough people doing that mm -hmm. so um, we love unintentional microaggressions yep yeah yeah i remember sitting in the theater watching that watching because i'd never read any of the books and i'm thinking wait this is what the orcs look like <laughs> wait, they're all just catching arrows. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, it was like this oh moment come over me. I'm like, I want to go home. <laughs> no, no. And how long oh. this movie is there? Two hours. <laughs> like, oh, man. Right. So starting off like this. Wow. Yeah. So, I'm already yeah, sad. <laughs> but and then I go to the bookstore and I'm like, there's there's gotta be there's got it's it just can't all be Eurocentric. It just can't be. And sure enough it was. And so if you think of well, if you're gonna include people of color in your art, you're gonna have to do it in your personal work because nobody's going to pay for that. Nobody's asking for it outside of like independent publishers or independent animation teams and stuff like that. Uh, nobody's asking for it. Nobody's paying a, a living wage for you to put people of color in your art. Um, so, I mean, that kind of, that can mess with somebody. If, if you're not professional, if you're not willing to bend and tailor your portfolio for the work that you can get, uh, you know, there's that's why there's so many people out there that are really good at what they do, but they, they're hobbyists. You know, they've got a nine to five doing something, but they don't chase after publishers or companies or animation studios that don't have any inkling of, of uh, or any kind of, they don't put forth any kind of effort to be inclusive, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. why should I chase after this job or this video game studio or this publisher if they're basically letting me know I don't exist, mm -hmm. right? So. <laughs> I mean, you should though, because if if people who look like us don't chase after those studios and 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 yell at them to make a change, that change will never happen. My thing well, is, you know, be be the change you want to see. Believe, but I I I I, and that's that's been kind of my my thing over the the past several years is to be that change that I wanted to see and to start painting uh, sci-fi pieces that uh, were more inclusive and not really thinking about where I'm going to aim this at or what publisher is gonna want this, just doing it for myself. And that's when I found, uh, you know, I, I ended up doing stuff that went viral and was seen by, mm. you know, yeah. Scholastic and, you know, all of these other different companies that were basically calling me up saying, can you do that for us? Like, I didn't know you guys wanted it. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. where have you been all my life? Oh my right. God. And that actually, you know, like that, that brings, uh, that segues perfectly also to Mia, who, you know, you've done the, if you want to introduce yourself to, um, that just remind as Eric was talking, that reminded me of how you did your, you know, Black uh, Alice in Wonderland um, series, and you know how how about you know you your occupation type of work, and what was your journey at being like in the, especially also in the fantasy illustration and target and um, not targeting <laughs> uh, approaching you know diversity and representation. 
Yeah, um, well, I'm Mia Araujo. Um, I'm a fantasy illustrator, but I'm self-employed. So I've actually, I've only have been hired for one project and that was back in 2008 to do a cover uh, for something. But um, but yeah, everything I've done pretty much art-wise has been my own work because I kind of started in a completely different way. Um, graduated from art school, uh, studying illustration, but didn't get any jobs in illustration. I, I don't think my portfolio was ready at the time. And I kind of had a weird way around it. I started showing in galleries and developing my style just selling my work in galleries and I sold my first paintings for like 50 bucks and like kind of worked up over the years like eight like eight years down the line just like you know selling to bigger collectors and stuff having my first solo show um and and you know I had a totally different style at the time where I was mostly focusing on like nature and and like uh, the, uh you know um all this kind of like really complicated paintings and stuff and just had a a change of like uh, evolution, I guess you would say in my art around 2013. And that was around the time that I got the idea for this project that I'm working on, which is an illustrated novel. Um, originally it was gonna be Alice in Wonderland, like word for word, Lewis Carroll's text with just my art. And I wanted to do it in a completely different way than I'd seen. Um, and like Eric, grew up a huge fantasy fan, but just was really tired of all these stories just only taking place in these sort of European worlds and uh, very, like narrow bracket of mythologies that were being used to represent the most imaginative genre out there. Um, so um, I just, uh, you know, decided to kind of create like my love letter to black people and in fantasy and basically create the worlds that I wanted to see in fantasy. Um, but I didn't go about it like trying to get paid for it. Basically, I just did it like Eric saying made it for me, you know, and, and I've still been working on it. Um, I did take nine to five jobs that were waiting tables and that sort of stuff to pay the bills while, while I've been working on this project and um, all these years it's basically evolved into different uh, you know stages I guess but it's now becoming a bit more of my story less of Lewis Carroll's story so I am writing it um, and illustrating it and kind of coming full circle because when I was a little kid I was writing and illustrating my own stories and just sort of Focus more on art as I grew up, but um, kind of circled back to writing and trying to interpret the story. And um, there was more and more I wanted to tell. Um, but yeah, I think that um, it's interesting. I love this conversation about um, about uh, just how the industry has changed and stuff like that over the years. But um, but Eric, you talking about not getting hired to do this kind of diverse work, almost like people have to approach you when they see you doing it, like making your passion project. Like in recent years, I've had um, you know, black clients come to me to commission portraits of themselves or their family or something because they've seen the work that I do, but, um, but no companies would approach me, you know, to do that kind of work. And so it's, it's almost like this weird catch 22 that we're trying to solve, I guess. But, um, but I just relate to that, like putting the work that you're really passionate about in your personal work and not necessarily in commercial work. So. Mm -hmm. And Lauren, what about, what about you? Yeah. Hi, I'm Lauren Brown. Um, I am currently a um, game developer and associate art director at a game studio, which I don't want to mention just because I'm not here representing them. Um, but I previously worked at uh, Electronic Arts, um, previously worked in animation at a studio called Floyd County Production nice. on, um, on shows like uh, Archer and um, The League, uh, Always Sunny in Philadelphia, um, as a background artist mainly, uh, sometimes character design, sometimes layout art as well. Um, so I've been in the industry for about nine years now, and um, so uh, I also do um, I do a lot of freelance as well. Um, I'm a fantasy illustrator uh, in my um, in my spare time, which eventually I would like to make it my full time um, you know job, and uh, you know be able to be able to use my my voice to also inc influence and increase diversity in the fantasy realms. Um, because like every time I would go around conventions. Uh, especially Dragon Con and other conventions like that, I would go into the art show and just look around and like look at all the faces of these high fantasy, imaginative, wild, beautiful worlds, and then only see, um, just like Eric was saying, just like only seeing, you know, just white people, blue -eyed, bl blonde, blue eyed, you know, white folks looking back at me. And I'm just like, well, you know, we can make anything, we can make anything we want. And yet we can't be imaginative on how these people are depicted. Like we can't be imaginative that anybody else besides European people can be in these worlds, in these roles being heroes. Um, and, you know, just like going around and seeing like, you know, any like the movies, like Disney movies where the villains were always the darker skinned villain or like, e like even Scar where it's like, oh, like the darker fur and like dark hair. Like there's all these, there's all this coding that is involved in the media. And I'm just like, you know what? Like, 
it's not going to matter if I'm making a hero or a villain or in between a side character. That I'm going to represent people of color any way I can. I'm going to represent Black people any way I can. And so um, around uh, 20, I think it was around 2014 or 2015, when I was living in Atlanta, I actually realized that there was really a need for that and an appreciation for that. And so I started to get client work that was actively asking me uh, to represent people of color, uh, people of different body types. Um, they're like, oh, it'd be great if there was also like a disabled person or a person wearing a, you know, a hijab or head covering or something like that. And I'll be like, that's amazing. And so I continued to get work like that because I would show, um, you know, just like, here's what these people could look like in these settings. You see how beautiful and natural they are. You want to put more of them in here. I know you do. <laughs> and so I would get jobs based on, based on that. And the most recent one that I'm working on now uh, is Deck of Wonders, um, which is on Kickstarter. And um, I was able to like, just make a bunch of just like awesome black warrior women and um you know like didn't matter if they were villains or heroes or in between um you know most of the characters depicted in that card game are people of color and i plan to continue that mission because i'm just like i dare y'all to say something it's going to mm -hmm. be in here <laughs> because that's what we need to see and people like you know they come to me and they're expressing they're like i'm so glad that you're you know creating these characters and these stories because um we don't get to see this enough and so i'm realizing that there you know there's a huge need for it and now that you know like as society becomes more progressive people are starting to realize how homo homogenous it has been so just working to change that mm -hmm. yeah and i think there needs to be more people like that <laughs> and, and in in both sides right creating and allowing for creative spaces uh, mm -hmm. to flourish because it's diversity and representation is important it's quite literally like you can't just make art for one thing or one group of people or you know it's just that's just it, there's nothing it just becomes the same repeating like boring thing and that's not what art is yeah um hi i'm <laughs> esther i draw mechs for fun and i once was a concept artist turned biz dev and, <laughs> and i highly am passionate about uh you know diversity and representation in the workplace as a person who has been i would say labeled as not Chinese enough, not American enough, not this enough, not that enough. I understand that. Uh, I, I sympathize with the struggle that you're just not enough mm -hmm. <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, and I think part of that does come with representation and that it is a representation problem where I can't just be like, for instance, Chinese American. <laughs> like it's, I have to uh, like, and with that said, like a lot of my personal experiences is I personally, like I've come to terms with it. It's, you know, I've had to numb myself to a lot of conversation topics, but I don't think that should be the way for literally anyone else. <laughs> Some people can be fine with numbing themselves and just being like, you know what, you know, that's my workspace. They say shit like that, that's fine. Um, but the reason why I'm also hosting and trying to uh, include more of these, like, or be part of more of these talks is to fight against that you know, like new coming artists, Black, Latino, Latinx, and whatever they want to, you know, label themselves or whatever background they come from, they don't have to defend the, their background. You know, mm -hmm. that's my personal take on it. And I paint mechs, so <laughs> that's that was my solution to diversity. Just don't have, just have robots. <laughs> <laughs> robots are fine. <laughs> right? No humans. Robots yeah, no humans. <laughs> No humans allowed. My world is no <laughs> humans. When we're talking about, you know, diversity and creativity, of course, there's the art element, but then there's, of course, there's also the social, <laughs> you know, element, which does come from, especially in a field, when it's not just your personal work, right? We all have to get money. We all have to pay for bills, get food. And so we can't also, we can't ignore, you know, diversity in the creative space. And before getting, uh, before talking more about, you know, our art slash personal projects, another topic of discussion uh, that I'd like to open up is, you know, working in creative spaces and having to deal with diversity, you know, like what issues have you guys faced uh, as your perceived, um, 
labels, I don't know if that's okay to say labels, but as your perceived selves, you know, like what issues have you faced and how has diversity actually, that topic has actually affected you as an artist, you know, in the field? So with that being, uh, with that being said, uh, Brie, or I already started off with Brie. You can uh, start with me. <laughs> oh, <all right. laughs> Come on. Brie's like, I'm ready to go. I, <laughs> Let's I go. know you guys have probably seen like me talk before, but I tend to go off. So, and I don't mean to, I just get really passionate. That's all. <laughs> just have feelings. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but yeah, for you, like what? what are the issues you face and also you know how does diversity or the topic of that has affected you as a professional working artist well, any one <laughs> thing that comes to mind well i've i've mentioned this before but i for me what affects me is is i'm 24 7 bothered by seeing posters of diverse talks but it's never the people who are talking about diversity are not diverse people. It's always <laughs> the same, you know, white people or unfortunately white passing, but it's never anything darker than that, you know? And, and how we, you can't have diverse talks without opening up a spectrum, like uh, just, just opening up and, and including more people, even if they haven't done a lot, you know, in the industry yet, but like giving them an opportunity to speak their voice or speak their truth or whatever, you know, I think that's just as important as like listening to the same people over and over and over again who just don't look like me or you or whomever, you know, I don't know, that that really bugs me a lot and I actually tend to ignore those those talks because of that. Like, that's not a diverse talk. I don't want to hear your talk on diversity. Um, but I know, like another thing that I, I it bothers me 100% is <laughs> looking at uh, uh, studio photos and seeing it's like 100 people or whatever and just like noticing, oh, well, there are like, there are no black people in this photo, are there? All of these people work at this big studio doing this awesome film and there is not one person of color in this whole group. Oh, wait, there's one right there. Like, oh, where's Waldo? It's like, where's yeah. Waldo? Yeah, I always, on those photos, I always intention, unintentionally look for, for like, where's the black face? I, and the one black yeah. face, there it is. <laughs> I oh, found it. <laughs> Someone who's racially ambiguous. Okay, we can go with one that. Token. <laughs> one token. You know, I'm so sick and tired of that. So that's definitely something that I, I think about that a lot. Um, but you know, some and I guess those are those are like quiet challenges I face, I suppose, you know, but I think the louder challenges uh would be standing up for myself against like and this is nothing in the present because thankfully the people I work with now are just absolutely amazing. But, you know, just before it would just be like finding my own voice and making sure that I was respected, you know, and, and heard by someone who might've been a director or what have you like, listen, I don't care what position you are. You are just as human as I am and you're going to fucking respect me. You know, that's how I feel. So, if you want, you know, us to work in just harmony or what have you, we need to, you need to hear me just as much as I hear you. And it doesn't matter what skin color I am, but mostly because I am black, you know, you need to hear me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, I've, I've dealt with that before and then, and it sucks. And it's like, well, I don't want to be the angry black lady, <laughs> you know, but I'm going to be if I have to be. <laughs> But I don't want to be like, don't let it get there. And and then I end up feeling really bad when I stand up for myself. I mean, I've, I've gotten a lot better with it. But you know, it's, I don't want to be made to feel bad because I have opinions and, and I want to be heard and things like that. And so I that's something that I have gone through and still from time to time do go through. Um, and And also just like being burned by people who you think should be on your side mm -hmm. like it's like mm -hmm. you know c coming across other black women who are in higher power and thinking that you can rely on them because of you know like that and that you can trust them because they open a door for you that's just like hey you i'm here for you let's work together this that and the other thing uplift one another 
and then up and out of nowhere, I want to ghost you. Like, that's not cool, you know? And I've dealt with that before, and that really hurts you because it's like, okay, it's one thing if some old white dude wants to ghost me, but it's another if, like, someone who looks like me is just being really shady. Like, that's not cool, you know? And so I feel like I'm no longer answering the question. <laughs> no, 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 you are. I, you are. You would say, I, I would say, I'm sorry, I would say that um, the two themes that you're talking about are basically tokenization yeah. and, you know, an us versus them right. uh, mentality that comes from underrepresentation. as you're saying, like, you don't want to be the sole angry Black woman, no, really <laughs> right? Oh No, I really don't. And it gets, and, you know, it's, I feel like I still am. And it's, <laughs> so I will say after you know, the Netflix uh, Black Creatives talk that we had, which was absolutely amazing. Um, after that, I've got it. Even now, I have had an influx of emails from stu other studios and even just like people and, and such asking me for work or for this, that, and the other thing. And I'm, most of the time I say no, because one, I don't want you to hire me just because I said something that is important. Go hire someone else. And two, like, I don't want to be your token. Like, mm -hmm. you know, my, my voice is not yours to just like pick and choose whenever you want to hear it. You know, where were you a year ago when I was looking for work? You know what I mean? When literally my portfolio has not changed, you know what I mean? So, and I don't want you to say you didn't see me because I know you did. <laughs> but, you know, it's stuff like that really irks me, I suppose. And it's like, this, I feel like this industry has an issue with picking and choosing when they want to see and hear Black folk, and I don't like that. Mm -hmm. And that needs to change. And I will say that the show that I'm on, and the color stylist on, on this phenomenal, beautiful show, um, I feel like I have a lot of power, and, and not in a greedy way, but in a way that like a lot of the characters, I get to color however I want. And when I say that I get to color them in this beautiful spectrum from cream to like black black i do and i do not hold back and i the, my art director is amazing and has never said you can't do that like it's it's a wonderful feeling you know and i feel like even i'm just the color stylist you know i it's i'm helping representation be seen on screen just even just do that i don't know where i'm going with this <laughs> <laughs> it's just interesting to hear you know like the progression uh you know like the journey that's taken you about the you know, diversity because you know it is a it is your art right it's something that you care about you do um and being in the animation industry uh you're finally allowed to do that although yes it, that's kind of suck when it comes off as a little tokeny you know right. like it's just convenient right. Right. um right. but that is that's a challenge that you face in creative spaces that like do you have a diversity problem? And I would say most creative spaces. Do you much have a diversity problem? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it doesn't have a diversity problem. <laughs> 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 um, I will say, really quickly, I will say my team is beautifully diverse. That's awesome. In, in, in uh, gender, sexuality, and, and uh, race. That's mm -hmm. awesome. It's... <laughs> so gross i love it so much <laughs> and, and it scares me because i feel like i'll never be able to have that again on a different team you know what i mean like when it's too good it's like you go to <laughs> something else and then you're like oh this is this is the reality <laughs> no I, I i think it's the beginning of something new um and that actually that's that's a great kind of like a for animation spaces uh I would say a, a good contrast would be how about you know fantasy spaces. You know, Mia and Eric, you can elaborate on that uh, since you guys have done more in illustration and uh, you know been more involved with you know Mia since you have to deal with more personal clients. Um, you know, especially at cons or freelance and whatnot. And Eric, you have to deal with also with freelance. You know, how, how has diversity been? You know, like a problem or not <laughs> okay. well i mean i'll i'll tell the story because uh i mean i've been doing this for 20 years now so if i don't have dirt to tell about something or somebody <laughs> he's I right been, i haven't oh. been doing it you know so 
back when I was in college, I took two courses in African history and African American history. Uh, basically having to pay money for what I didn't learn in 12 years of public school. So I was finding out about all these atrocities, all these things and, you know, coming home and screaming like, did you know this happened? I can't believe this is what's gone, had went, went on in this country or, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And my dad saying, yeah, this is, this is why, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> like <laughs> just all these horrible things. So I was walking around, I was in, I went to the School of Visual Arts in New York City and I was like always walking around like just mad, just angry. <clears throat> and I was in my science fiction illustration course, science fiction illustration class. And the instructor invited an art director. I'm gonna be very careful about how I say this. <laughs> invited an <laughs> art director to come into the class to, uh, if, you know, basically it's kind of like one of those guest instructor, guest, uh, guest that comes in for the classes and, you know, they look at your portfolios, they answer questions and all that stuff. And <clears throat> I'm, God, at the time, I'm 20 years old, full head of hair and <laughs> luxurious. <laughs> Sorry. No, I had to throw that in there. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so I'm, I'm sitting there and all these, all these people, all these, all the students, all their questions are, well, what do you want to see in a portfolio? Uh, how do I contact you now? This, mind you, this is 20 years ago. This is, there's e like Lycos is an email account, right? Yahoo is a big deal. Like there was no social media, no MySpace, none of that stuff. So if you wanted to contact an art director, you had to mail a postcard. <laughs> you, you know, oh, you yeah. You had to physically mail a postcard and, and hope that they didn't go, uh, this is crap, and then just chuck it, right? <laughs> so it, so to have an art director sit in right in front of us and say, well, if you if, think if there's if your stuff is good enough, they might just slip you your, slip you their email and say, well, send me a couple of JPEGs or here's my personal address, e uh, mail me some stuff when you get a chance. I'm not thinking about any of that. My, I, from the minute this art director walked into the room and all these other people finished asking their questions, the, the teacher asked, well, does anybody have any other questions? <clears throat> and I just remember saying, yeah, this is where I dropped my bomb on, on, on the art director. I said, yeah, why is it that there are no depictions of black people on the covers of sci-fi fantasy novels? Now this is, a major art director for a major sci-fi fantasy publisher. And the whole room went silent, <laughs> like I just slapped somebody, right? <laughs> and the teacher looks at me like, you will never get work from this person. <laughs> oh, no. Like Holy his shit. eyes just bugged out of his head. <laughs> like, oh my God, like that was not, what I was expecting, it was it was probably embarrassing for him, but I wanted to know. It was a valid question mm -hmm. because yep. as a as a fan of sci-fi fantasy art, and as a, a kid, that when we went to the mall, my mom would drive us to the mall, and she'd go to J.C. Penney's, and I would be in Barnes and Noble or Walden Books in one corner of that bookstore, just looking at all the new release covers, and be like, "Oh, that's a Stephen Yule." Oh, that's a Donato or that's a Todd Lockwood or, you know, being able to call out the covers and look at that stuff and be like, oh, this is amazing. I want to do this one day. And then always seeing, okay, there's no representation here ever, mm -hmm. ever. And finally having somebody sit in front of me that hires for that stuff and be able to ask, why is this? Why have I been going to the bookstore looking at this stuff for the past like 10 years of my life and never seeing not one cover from any publisher and being told well uh there aren't after like a after a, a brief pause where the room kind of took the breath and <laughs> exhaled uh I, the, the response i got was well there aren't many black authors that submit manuscripts or, or submit to the to the companies and I'm thinking to myself do you ask do you look for it do you 
advertise that you want to see that stuff? Because I know they're out there. You know, there's got to be more people out there than Samuel Delaney and Octavia Butler. And, you know, there can't be just two. There mm -hmm. can't be just two Black authors in the world that are submitting stuff to major publishers. They're, they're out there. You just don't want them. That's, that's what it came down to. That's basically what I heard. And then to later on, F, F, over the years, find out from a lot of Black authors, oh, well, we've submitted, but it ends up in a slush pile or, or they, it's not what they want. Or they get told, well, the, we love the story, but can you change the race of the protagonist? Or mm. can you change this? Can you change that? They've got to alter the book, right? Uh, there's been a couple of really popular Black authors, sci-fi authors that have gone on to do stuff for HBO and all this, you know, big Hollywood movies that when they first started their career, they would, the story was intact as a Black protagonist, but the cover was a white lady with a spaceship in the background, you know, because they, the public, at some point, some committee said, this book won't sell with a Black face, right? That's a conversation that happened not even 15 years ago. All right, so that bothered the hell out of me. And at that point, 20 years ago, I had to make a decision. Is this a genre? Is this a field of illustration that I wanna pursue? Because I know in my heart that if I put black people in my art, I will never get work. Not from this art director who is not making any effort whatsoever and not from any of their friends or, or people that I might see at a convention. They don't want it. They don't want to see it. So what am I going to have to create to get work? That's a heavy thing to have to think about, especially when you're putting a portfolio together. Like people don't have to think about that. Typically when they're making a, a portfolio for art to, to go out into the world and find work, what should I not be painting? Right? Well, like typically don't paint anything sexual perverted. That's about, that's about it, right? I mean, if you're going to do sci-fi <laughs> fantasy art, that's the cutoff. Don't do anything nasty. But you know, my thing is don't do anything nasty and don't put any black folks in it because you will not get work. They will say, well, you got some nice rendering abilities or, you know, or they'll tell, or they, they looked at my portfolio. Some one art director looked at my portfolio, could see that my stuff was as good, if not better than the artist that he currently used, but told me that I wasn't ready for prime time. I wasn't good enough, right? Because of what was the content of my portfolio. I thought, okay. But what was funny about that was what wasn't good enough for some publishers because of their bias was good enough for Blue Man Group, what a workshop. <laughs> All these other companies that I ended up working with, they were like, wow, how, what's your hourly rate? I'm like, oh, sweet. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, my career kind of diverged into concept art and, and other avenues and, and get video games and all these other things that took me away from what my goal was when I went to college, which was just to paint book covers. That's what I wanted to do. And at at a point somewhere around 2018, I, I kind of just said to myself, this is never going to happen. I've, I've, I'm doing work for all these different publishers, all these different other companies, but the stuff that I went to school for, the stuff that I trained myself to learn how to do, to paint portraiture, to paint re like a realist painter, to do mimic that digitally in Photoshop, I'm never going to be able to do that for these mainstream publishers because they don't want what I'm, what I want, what I would love to be painting, the characters that I would love to be painting. So I did one final image for just for myself, just to say, okay, well, if I'm going to go out, if I'm never, if I'm never going to do this, this is what a black woman in a sci-fi setting would look like if you just let me do it. And I did it, put it online, it went viral. And within a month, I had an agent contacting me saying, we love your work. Would you like to be represented by us? And I'm like, 
is this is this you know <laughs> like, is this Lisa? like who's who's messing with me right <laughs> and and uh so that agent i basically they i got them on the phone and they they said we love your stuff we think there's a huge market for what you do and i'm the whole time my mouth is open i'm like i can't believe i'm listening to this i can't believe this i'm hearing this and the the agent says yeah there's there's certain demographics certain markets in publishing that are really hungry they're thirsty for this and like and uh basically said what what kind of work would you like to be doing more of and i said i want to be doing more sci-fi fantasy book covers and they said we got you and maybe a month after that i get an email saying disney loves your work are you available <laughs> like wow wow so it's basically been me realizing oh i was it's not that publishers didn't want it i was aiming my portfolio at the wrong people the wrong crowd for the past 20 years i was aiming my portfolio at the wrong art directors all i had to do was change the age group <laughs> that the that the art was aimed for <laughs> and middle grade and you know, young adult covers that's where all the inclusive art that's where all the of the people of color are popping up in the art all the narrative fun illustrations colorful stuff and i'm like it's it just it makes it makes me giddy it makes me giggle because this is where I wanted to be and I kind of my whole career has kind of been going around thinking I wasn't going to be able to do that so uh I don't look back you know at at certain art directors I'm like what why should I bother mm -hmm. you know <laughs> submitting my stuff to you I to this day I could go on their website right now and count that one book that they put out per year that's got any kind of inclusive art in there. So whatever. <laughs> uh, that's been kind of my my little path. My oh, the other thing <laughs> is uh, I would love to see more black illustrators like really strong realist painters that can hold their own and do you know stuff for magic the gathering or uh you know concept art for movies visual developments for stuff like that <clears throat> instead of black illustrators only being called on when it's time to paint slaves or mm -hmm. images of black pain right there's I know guys personally that have made their whole careers off of just painting slaves and civil rights children's books. And I mean, it pays. I mean, I look at the size of their house and I'm like, I'm like, damn, should I be painting <laughs> slaves? Like you go to visit and you're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> like, but part of me would just die inside. I'm like, I'm not painting that stuff, mm -hmm. you know? So, <laughs> but, uh, and I've told my, I told my agent, you know, like, I, I absolutely refuse. If somebody comes at me and goes, wow, you've done this stuff for Disney. When do you want, you want to paint some slaves? Absolutely not. Get out of here. If you want that, go contact some call the cot winner. You will get a home run every time. It's not going to be me. So <laughs> that's, <laughs> I did pretty good not naming, dropping names. Proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> the condensed the bridge. Hard. Yeah. <laughs> oh, anyway. <laughs> I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna yeah, stop. I'm gonna like, keep on. <laughs> I was just like, huh? <laughs> I can, because I got stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Nope. I might have to save that for a second, second talk. <laughs> might have to have you on the show. Yeah. Oh, so. Who said that? <laughs> 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 but yeah, Mia, would you like to? <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like hearing Eric talk about like uh, your whole career and everything like that. Honestly, it's like I think that um, these days it's uh, it's so different in terms of 
like hearing you talk about like all I had to do is pivot, but I feel like it was different. Like 20 years ago, I don't think as many publishers and you know companies were even looking for diversity. People are looking for it more now. And it breaks my heart to think of artists like you who've had to, you know, step away from what you actually wanted to paint because you had to pay the bills and that sort of thing. And um, I mean, and for, for me personally, I, I, I don't know. I think I was a late bloomer. My skills just kind of weren't employable at the time, like back when I was having this sort of transition between gallery stuff. Um, so I actually chose to, just for my mental health, to take the stress off my art and just do a non-art job to pay the bills and just figure out what I was trying to do with my stuff. Um, and I guess, like, I haven't been hired, like I said, I had one client back in 2008. Um, so, and my commission clients, it's different. They come to me because they want what I make um, for the most part. So it's, I don't have the same experience as all of you when it comes to this, but um, just on the convention floor, I guess, has been my way of seeing how people respond to diversity in art and stuff. And it's obviously different. Like I, I'm not black. And so maybe I will have different, I know I will have different interactions with people uh, on the convention floor based on the work that they see. But I did have a lot of interesting conversations with people that would come up and say, why are you doing this? And that sort of thing. And I feel like in person, it's easier to have these conversations because you can have a conversation and, and they're looking at you in the eye and they see where you're coming from and what you're trying to do with everything. Um, and I feel like um, there, there was this one gentleman, I remember he was a, uh, a black gentleman that came up to me at Gen Con, which is in the Midwest in the US. And he was basically saying, I've been coming to the show for 30 years and have, and, and just, it's really hard to pick out any kind of art that doesn't just all have white fantasy characters. That show is a very fantasy centric um, show. And so he was, you know, he was having a conversation with me about, you know, does, does diverse art just not sell as well as art with white characters in it? And uh, it was, I think those conversations are important to have, but I think that things are changing now. And I feel like maybe back when he was first coming to the show, that was the case. I think people want more diversity now. There's still a lot further we have to go as a society to make that evolution completely. But um, the way I see it is like, there, there's definitely a bias, a, a white, you know, bias towards, you know, what content people want to make. And I just want to throw all the artillery at that at that gate as much as possible in every in every any way that I can or um, actually in the last couple years or two years ago I started a series on my site where I wanted to I was interviewing artists of color and I wanted to have a photo of them and their art so as you're scrolling through here you see all this incredible art and then you see hopefully like young artists can see artists or, that look like them but also I was hearing a lot of art directors just saying I want to hire diverse artists but I just don't they're just not out there or I can't find them. They and so, are. They are. They are out there. And they're so it's there. just, that, that was my way of trying to show like, I want you to scroll through this, look at all this amazing art and tell me they're not out there, you know? But I definitely don't have a big following. I don't have a big platform. So um, I, took, I took a pause to sort of think about how I could better, you know, support artists uh, like black and brown artists in particular. But, um, but I feel like if we all kind of pull together and use, like, I, I guess the thing is like people with bigger platforms could be shining a light on, on uh, diverse artists and stuff. Um, but it's just like, it's just a matter of wanting to look for it. Um, and, you know, artists are out there and stuff. So um, anyway. I just um, yeah. wanted to just jump in because um, I noticed that my, my following I gained probably like a thousand people in like two days after that, after the, the Black Lives Matter protests a couple months ago. And all of these Instagram huge name people with like 500,000 followers and whatnot are tagging my stuff going like, there's, here's all, all these black artists you should be following online. And then I'm seeing, you know, Art, uh, creative directors and all these art directors popping up talking about oh black artists send me your portfolios mm -hmm. you know I I want to I want to support you and blah 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 and I'm thinking I sent you my portfolio last year you didn't give a damn right right yeah, all of a yep. sudden Ooh, all, now, like, all of a sudden you care, care. All the, yeah all of a sudden right? I exist to Why you do you care about so, it took, so it took a pandemic Mm -hmm. People writing Black Lives Matter on the ground mm -hmm. that you could see from space before yep. you're like, oh, I didn't know you were out here making yes. making sci-fi art. Like maybe Black Lives Matter. Send me your portfolio. Yeah. All those jokes. Oh. Mm -hmm. Like I could have like, sworn I had drinks with you at a convention last year. Get out of my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? 
but that's it's it's I'm like man don't nope like, yeah, so- and this whole in- this whole issue is interesting for me too because in the studio space in particular, they were also facing that same issue of just like, oh, we don't know where the diverse talent is. We really want to hire diverse talent, but we don't know what to do about it. And I'm just like, if you don't take your behind to like anywhere like Twitter and just look off, search on Black Twitter for a second, you'll right. find some amazing artists there. You'll find artists anywhere. There's right. so many places to look. But the thing is, is that they never change up their strategy to actually look for these people. They only look for the people, the channels with what they know the best, which are mostly um, channels of people who already work at the place, which are most likely going to be white people. And so therefore they're going to get those same, you know, people coming in and they're not going to get diverse talent because they don't change up their strategy at all. They don't make any effort towards it. All they do is like say the words and they feel like as long as they can say the words, that's enough effort and it's not nearly enough. And, you know, like I've been working, um, you know, for a while now to try to increase the amount of diversity at all levels, just like uh, through, you know, middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students, uh, stu- like people who had just gotten out of, of school and want to break into the industry. Uh, we had a, um, a black employee resource group um, at my old studio uh, that was, you know, trying to be intentional about it. And we actually brought in 50 students from uh, HBCUs across the country and uh, historically black colleges and universities for anybody who doesn't know. Um, and we had them you know, come into our studio, actually see what the life was like. We did a panel for them presentation. We, did, we took them on a tour and everything. And then afterwards we did resume and um, you know, portfolio reviews as well. And like kind of talked them through and helped them update uh, you know, their, their work. And then it was about a month later and I'm just like looking at, you know, the new hire lists and, you know, the, the new intern lists. And I'm just like, where are all the black students that we brought in th- mm-hmm. to here? Cause like they were, they're ready to be interns. They're, like some of them were getting out of college. Where are they? And so I, I reached out to, um, you know, one of my people and asked, I was like, Hey, like where, what happened to these students? Like, are we getting any of them through? Like what's going on? I, I know we we're going to interview some of them. And the response I got back was literally, they weren't quality talent. Like that's what they said, and all four actually no three out of four of the students that I that I had interviewed did a did a resume review for were amazing. Like they had they were leaders in their community. They had like done all the work. Like they were like 4.0 GPA, just like getting it. Like they were self starters. They were educated. Like they, they were everything that we we could have used. Right. And I'm just like, what do you mean they're not quality talent? Like what are you talking about? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And it's like, so even when we make the effort to bring those, you know, to, to bring those students in, to bring, you know, that diverse talent in, it's still so many barriers keeping us not, like, keeping us unable to get into those spaces. And so it's just like, it's like, it needs to be broken down in so many different ways, um, you know, but that particular comment was said by a Black man. And so it's just like, it's even more hurtful because, like, right. was, you know, like, you know, like, you sometimes you don't even have your allies where you're supposed to have them, you know, and mm-hmm. it was really hurtful to to see that. But, you know, fortunately, a few months later, one of them um, did get hired, but it was only one out of 50. There should have been more. And so, you know, like they, they always like, there's always this talk about like, oh, we want more diverse talent. We want to hire more diverse talent, like black, uh, you know, black artists, please send us your por- portfolios. That effort needs to remain intentional and continuous. And that channel always needs to be open. It cannot just be a trend. Uh, our lives are not a trend. So that's the most frustrating thing about this whole thing. It's like, I appreciate all the support that has come from this. Like my follower count has like basically quadrupled, um, you know, since, since all the protests had started. But, you know, it's just like, then that attention kind of goes away. Like people just forget again. And that fade back into obscurity is like, that's what I don't want to see. Like, I want to continue to remind people. It's like, hello, we're here. We're still looking for work. We're never going to go away. So, um, so what's up? It's like either walk that walk and talk the talk, or or else you know, or else don't. Like make your intentions clear if you're not going to do it for us. But if you're going to pretend like you care, I would like to make this a real thing. I want you to actually care about us. So, Laura, let me know, ask you a question. Yeah. I'm sorry. Let me ask you a question. Mm-hmm. Did you ever feel like you had to be like 150 percent? all the time all (laughs) the time like you just can't be good enough you can't just phone it in i have to be you gotta be amazing and that's actually what i told um one of i've been a manager in um in the industry now for five years and when and i told one of my reports um, first off it took a while to get that respect in the first place but i had to let them know it's like i am here and we're going to get this stuff done and we're going to get it done well 
And what I told one of my reports is like, he was like, you know, like, how do you, how do you deal with um, people not respecting you or people, um, you know, just like not being seen as disposable or anything like that in the industry. And I was like, you just have to be, I, I'm a black woman. So I have to work 200% <laughs> as hard as anybody else does in order to get any recognition, in order to be seen at the same effectiveness as my white colleagues are seen at. And that's just, you know, it's not an intentional thing that anybody's trying to put on me, but it's, it's a, you know, it's a bias. And, you know, I have to work hard. I have to, I have to do everything perfectly. And if I don't do anything, if I don't do something perfectly, I hold myself really, really, you know, I'm, I'm very hard on myself. But like, that's what, that's what needed to be done. Like, that's what had to be done for me to, you know, to, to move up to where I am now, because like, there was no other way to do it. Nobody was going to give me any allowances for being lazy or doing a half-assed job or doing, you know, just like subpar work. I, I had to be an amazing, you know, artist and an amazing manager and get my scatterbrain behind organized and just get everything done because otherwise it wasn't going to happen. And, you know, it's worked out for me, but a lot of other people, it's, I mean, it's difficult to have to work so hard for, for so long for people who may or may not appreciate you and not everybody is able to do it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah and so like I feel like raising that awareness that we're here and these are the things that we have to go through is going to help but we have to continue to to keep that momentum going or else we're not going to be able to get anywhere right. yeah but. I remember applying for a, a game studio job and having the human resources person look at my portfolio and then go get the creative director and then the art director they both came in and looked at my stuff and were kind of like you could see the expressions on their face, kind of like their eyes, kind of like bugging out of their face <laughs> and asking me questions like, how did you create this? And I explain how I created it. And they're just like, oh man, right? And then there are, then the human resources person coming back and saying, telling me, uh, we don't think you're a right fit. Like oh. their jaws just dropped. Yeah, and I'm not a right fit. Oh yeah, the like, all wonderful thing of culture fit. That's great. Right, exactly. Like, oh wow, okay. Yeah. So I just, I, I thought, you know, that then that wasn't the right place. That wasn't you know, right. I feel like all of this, all of this needs to, the respect for artists of color and black artists especially really needs to start when we are young and not just start when we're trying to get into the industry, but it, it definitely needs to start from high school, especially if you're going to an art high school, like I, I did. And then if you're going to an art university, uh, when I was getting ready to graduate, I was friends with uh, one of the directors of my school, which is an older, older woman. Um, and I was showing her my portfolio, which mind you, some of the work that I showed her then, and especially the one I'm about to tell you, is still on my portfolio to this day. And, and it, it's a like a black take on, um, a black and indigenous take on Rapunzel. And I was showing it to her and I was so proud of it. And mind you, she had worked at major, you know, big name companies and things like that and had done some amazing work. And I was so excited to show it to her. And she was just like, you don't need to have it in your portfolio. You're already black. You don't need to have more black work in your, in your, in your portfolio. And I was, and to this day, I'm so offended by that, you know? Oh yeah. Um, and it's it's just kind of gross <laughs> and actually after that i stopped hanging out with her <laughs> fair like, i, I, I will be right I, back I, I oh okay like i stopped um going to her office and spending time with her it was just like i just don't want that in my life i don't need that in my life i will draw what i want to draw mm -hmm. thank you and I will get work based off of that. Thank you. You know, mm -hmm. and I have been, and it's been fantastic. But I guess, you know, what I'm trying to say is the, the respect that the industry wants to try to have for a Black artist needs to start so early on so that we know that we are just as valuable and not tokens and not a trend, you know. Um, and then the other thing, um, and I, I don't even know if we were going to like, to talk about this but speaking of trends if if you've got a show and this is for pretty much for everyone show creators people thinking about becoming a, a showrunner or what have you if you think if, if, if you've got a beautiful cast of different 
colors. And if you are, you know, casting voice talent that doesn't necessarily match up with what you have on screen, I personally don't care. That's just me, you know, because we've had a trend of that, of voice talent quitting to make space for people of color. My opinion on that is, listen, shut up. You got the job, put your sock in it. <laughs> Instead of quitting and trying to fill that space with a now token black voice actor who has to fill big shoes and be just as good as you were at your job, make space. Why not design more characters of color and then bring in more voice actors of color to fill those roles? You know, we've been seeing a lot of, you know, really a lot of white people stepping down from their hard earned jobs to have one black person fill that role. I, I hate that. I think it's really gross. And I'm probably stating an unpopular opinion, but I feel like instead of doing that, just make more fucking roles so that other people can join in instead of just, oh, I'll step down so one person can join in. It doesn't work that way. You're not a hero. I don't respect you more for doing that. I actually <laughs> dislike you more for doing that. <laughs> now you're making the story all about you and I don't give a shit about you. Instead, just make more space for more people. Keep your damn job. You worked hard to get it, you know? And I don't know, that's just me. Um, my skin's really hot and I'm getting all fired up, so I'm gonna. <laughs> but, um, so, so everyone's kind of gone over also challenges, uh, you know, in workspace and creating their art. And the general theme is that, you know, like if you don't show it now, like you, you won't be prepared for when the opportunity, even as tokenizing as it may be, you know, whenever the opportunity presents itself. But now I want to also just ask kind of like the question, um, now that you're here, at this point of your art journey, you know, like having fought for diversity, having fought for your representation, having also to stick with your values, being like, hell no, I'm doing this <laughs> and I'm going to be paid for by this because I can't be wrong. <laughs> like there aren't, you know, people that represent me. So therefore that's, you know, that needs to be changed. So I would, I want to ask like, do you guys have advice actually for like, future people, um, future creators, artists in the industry, and also, you know, as Brie was going on about, like, even current, you know, showrunners and uh, creators, because, you know, like, I also have that question, too, where, for example, I'm an environment artist. I paint mechs, you know, like, I personally, like, didn't feel comfortable, like, if I inserted people literally that weren't, like, <laughs> Asian, <laughs> like, that weren't Asian, like, even painting like a white person or Caucasian or, you know, that descent bothered me because I was like, this isn't really, I don't jive with this and I don't know why. So do you have advice for people who, one, want to include diversity in their works as an artist? And then also on the other side, you know, like how do you basically give advice to people who want diversity without stepping into the tokenization, you know, because that's the biggest problem, right? Because it's trendy it might be like tokenization and that's inhumane. <laughs> but um, Lauren, do you want, or Eric, I see yeah. you, you got, you got yeah, the I eyes. Her. I oh, just saw it. Like, okay. <laughs> you know, I have, I have a lot. Eyes. Well, um, okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord, should I say my piece first? Let's do it. I don't, I don't see, uh, I know it's trendy. And I know that a lot of the stuff, a lot of the projects that I've gotten over the past two years probably would not have come along if Black Panther had it bombed in theaters. Like if if that movie had done the numbers of Blank Man, I don't know if that people remember, you remember Blank Man? I remember Blank Man. If it had done Blank Man numbers, people would have said, have you guys lost your minds? Never do that again, ever. Right, never do another. We no Black Panther to just sh you know bury it, but it made a billion dollars. So other so publishing kind of opened their eyes and said, oh, not it. What had nothing to do with there not being enough representation in publishing. It was oh, there's money to be made here. 
if we capitalize on this and start being more inclusive. It all comes down to money. All right. So, um, but that said, I would tell anybody, any artist of color that wants to do whatever in the arts uh, to follow their heart and paint the kind of thing that they want to paint or draw or animate or write or whatever it might be. Um, I, I, wa I listened to a, a speech by a Taoist philosopher named Alan Watts back in 2012, 2011, and it messed me up. It mentally just messed me up because he asked the question, what would you do if money were no object? What would you do with your life, with your time, if money were no object? And if you stop long enough and answer that question for yourself, it can turn your life in a different direction. Like I had to, I was sitting in a cubicle at a video game studio listening to this, this, this man speak. And my answer was not here. I don't want to be here. <laughs> I want to be painting sci-fi fantasy art. I want to be painting. I want to be oil painting again. I want to be doing concept designs and I want to be painting black people having adventures in outer space and, and all that stuff. I want to be having fun doing that. And if, you know, you, you, even if, even if that's not your nine to five, some part of you has to do that. It has to do something that you are passionate about that even if money were no object and you didn't have to worry about anything, you would, you would wake up every day knowing that this is, this is your passion. This is your, your purpose to do that. And if you do it long enough and you are good at it, eventually somebody will call you up and offer you money for what you do, for what you would have done for free. Right. And the past two and a half years of my life has been proof of that. Just do what you love and somebody will call you up one day and say, are you available? So-and-so loves your work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and and, I, and it, it, whenever I hear people spout off that motivational stuff and like, you got to dream and you got to believe in yourself, like that Will Smith's kind of, you know, he gets all, so righteous on Instagram, like you gotta believe and do this and uh, Paulo Coelho and all. And I think that's yeah, nonsense, but it's the truth. <laughs> like it's you gotta believe in yourself. You gotta just go out there and do it. Put it in people's faces and just say, "Yeah, I am here. I am as good, if not better, than everybody else in the room. Respect me." Mm -hmm. And here's why. Mm. And <laughs> like, that's. That's, that's it. I mean, that's, I, I tell my students, do what you love, you know, focus your portfolio on what you love to do. And if I, if I, basically, if I asked you, what would you do right now? If you, if you, if you could just pause time, what would you be doing right now? You know, and everybody might have a different answer. I'm like, well, go do that. Go do that. Yeah. So that's my, that's my parting words. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah um i definitely sympathize with that a lot um i had realized i was like struggling a lot with um uh for gen con just like understanding how to express myself because i'd been in that space before as an attendee and seeing um you know what was what the normal work was like at that show and thinking that my stuff wouldn't fit in at all like i maybe have to tailor myself more to this like fantasy audience this crowd um, because I didn't think people would accept what I was doing. And um, I put myself in such a bad artist block that I actually only managed to make one piece. But that one piece was like, just like, I was like, F it. We're just going to make exactly the thing I want to do, which is fashion, mushrooms, melanin. Let's go. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's what it was. And that piece got like the most overwhelming response that I'd ever gotten for any print that I'd ever done. And I was just like, oh, so they just, they just want me. I understand now. <laughs> they just want me. It's totally okay. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah, I can definitely, um, I co-sign that advice 100%. It's just like, if you draw authentically 
to what you believe in and to what you really are passionate about, people will notice and people will see it. Um, you know, it's like, even like if you want to like whoever you want to paint paint it like don't just include diversity just because you think that you have to or don't just do it because like you're like oh like i feel obligated twitter will crucify me if i don't have a black person in this scenario it's like don't be inauthentic about it if you're going to paint a black person like you should want to paint a black person if you're going to paint a latin person paint a latin person but don't force it just because you think that's what everybody wants to see um you know like make it authentic to your experience and so that's what I would say to the creators that are, you know, in those spaces, but the ones who already have a platform or the companies out there or whoever might be listening, who has some kind of power to make any kind of change. What I would say to them is, you know, make space for the people who can't get their voices heard because um, they're, we're all out there. We're like, tons of us are out there. We're all creating, we're all hungry. We all are, you know, there's a lot of really talented people out there who haven't gotten an opportunity because of the, the reasons that we all mentioned earlier in this panel. Um, there's many there's many places and resources that you can go to um you know there's like the, the black lives matter card like there's like ways to like you know like donate see visibility you can search black artists on twitter uh drawing well black hashtag thank you abel hayford for making that um you know like they I, I, I was actually able to find a bunch of artists through that because we were looking for a concept artist at my studio and i just like searched that hashtag and just like flood of talent so many people who were completely qualified like amazing amazing artists and so there's definitely, there's many ways um, that you can find that talent. You just have to expand the field in which you look in. And, you know, like, don't only go to your one friend that you always go to, but try to ask other people. See how diverse you can get in your, in your field of people. And don't make it just a one-time thing. You didn't do just one hire and then that's it, you're done. You have to keep this effort going. Be active in this pursuit. So, you know, like, make sure that, you know, like, you... Like if people can't get their voices heard, you know, try to try to be there for them, try to mentor them, elevate them on whatever platform you have. Um, but keep doing it. Do not stop doing it. So that's the that's the advice that I would give. Can I can I rip off of the both of you? Absolutely. Um, coming from a character and costume designer, you know, and I'm just gonna point to the behind me. Yes. You know, don't be afraid to, you know. If you're gonna go dark, don't be afraid to go hella dark. You know, go dark. Go, go, go like purple dark. Go <laughs> purple dark. You know, those, in all honesty, those people exist. They they are so their skin tone is so gorgeous, and not to even be gross about it, but like skin comes in the most beautiful variety of colors, right? And so, if you're talking representation go albino and go the opposite of that, you know, and don't be afraid to do that because when we see that, you know, whether you're a black artist or, or are not, when you see that it's, it's the most amazing thing because it's like, Oh, Holy crap. Why haven't I seen that before? Now I want to do that. And then more people are going to want to do that. And, and you know, if, if, if you want to draw something that you haven't seen before, don't be afraid of thinking that no one's going to like it because the people who will like and love it will find it and it will be for them. You know, not everyone's gonna like what you draw. That's the thing. Not every director is gonna wanna hire you. Not every recruiting manager is gonna wanna give you the time of day, but your work will be found by someone who will, who is looking for it. And, and it, sometimes it takes time and it sucks, but that's the reality. Things take time. We are in an industry that moves slow, whether we like it or not. It, it's a snail's pace <laughs> but sometimes it's actually really fast which is really awesome too um so i would say you know use that time wisely when people are looking at your portfolios like quietly without even telling you to show them you know okay you've seen this now look at this you know you've seen you know me design characters the black characters that are sci-fi or or um you know, uh, just, just anything really. But now look at me designing black characters in high fantasy, you know, um, look at me putting black characters underwater or something, you know, because uh, the world that we live in, the natural world that we live in is so diverse. You go outside and you see everybody and anybody, right? If you look at, um, if you look at like, I'm from New York City. So if you look at a map of New York City um, where showcases like, uh, where people are from, um, it's wild, like Estonia and Mongolia and this, that, and the other thing. 
why is it so hard to represent that in in comics or animation or or fantasy world or what have you? Not, not everything has to be Eurocentric. And even if you want to look at you know be a costume designer and design stuff that is very like French or what have you, you don't have to put just a blonde blue eyed person in it. You know that's the thing. Like for me, for my work, I like to mix and match because you can create the most wonderful things out of that um and so i guess my advice to people who are looking for more than just representation but looking for something new and if you can't find it then do it yourself you know if you feel like you know you're a really amazing or up-and-coming talent and you want to be a part of something new and wonderful but you can't seem to find it and then start it and don't be afraid to start it because other people will follow mm -hmm. and and for people in much higher positions and i'm talking to like directors and art directors and and vps and things like that it, get out of your ass <laughs> honestly and and stop you know looking in the same exact places all the time and also stop asking your black friends the same questions over and over and over again like, you have a brain, you have a brain, you have Google, you have the internet. The important one, you Why? have Google. We are tired. <laughs> I'm so tired of people coming to me and asking me, how do I find this? Where do I find this? I'm not answering your question. <laughs> Think, common sense. My mother ingrained in me common sense, and I still struggle with having it myself. But where's your common sense at? is my question you know why do i have to answer the hard questions for you why why can't you do the work a little bit of work that's all it takes is a little bit of work. it's all in front of you that's the thing are you that blind <laughs> that's the thing you know and so it's it, i'm not gonna hold your hand i'm tired of holding people's hands you know, um, I don't mind like show like turning a light on for you, but you got to do the work and look the stuff. You know, so that's that's my advice to people who are higher up, who are are interested in being a part of the change, but don't know how to be a part of the change. I suppose. Yeah, that's what I gotta say. <laughs> awesome. All right. <laughs> Mia, would you like to add? There's actually something I want to riff off of what the three of you said, but um, <laughs> on that note, I feel like it's hard to fake like curiosity or an actual genuine passion for something. And I think that to the question of like what to tell like up and coming, you know, black and brown artists and stuff, it's like if you're passionate about it, just do it, you know? And it's like what you all have been saying that people will come when they can tell that you're passionate about this thing and that it's genuine to you and it's authentic to yourself. And it might be a niche audience. It might be a smaller audience than you like. It might not be as mainstream. It might be less, you know, not as many people that will employ you for it, but you'll be doing the work that you love to make. Um, and with that, you know, with that in mind, unfortunately money is an object, right? And money is how we survive in this world. So uh, going into the, like, I wish I had known when I started out how hard it is to make a career out of making art and how hard it is to make a career making art that I want to make and that I don't want people to tell me I can't do this or whatever, or that that it's gonna be take time to find my audience or it's gonna take time to find my skills as well and all that stuff. So make a backup plan, whether that's, um, you know, like, build a community that's something too when i started out is very much like i create my work only in this vacuum and stuff but as i've matured and grown as a person i realized that my allies my friends you know the people i know the people i meet will will come around and support that that's kind of how you uh, it's another way to sort of support your career over time so it's like if you if you see an artist out there that's painting something that you want to learn how to do reach out to them they might just answer you know and it's like um, or if there's a skill that you don't have, like graphic design or something that would make your portfolio stand out, you know, maybe there's a friend you have and you can ask them to help you, but just like, you don't lose anything by asking the people in your life. Um, and it doesn't make you weaker for it. It's, I think the artists that use your community and uh, like create a community around them are the ones that actually do get farther. And it's like, I think that's what slowed me down for so many years is that I tried to do everything myself. So, um, and that, that, you know, uh, like weighs down on me mental health wise as well. So it's like, I would say like your community for sure, a backup plan financially in terms of if stuff takes longer than usual or your plan doesn't go according to how you want it to. 
And then the last thing is mental health, like at all costs protect that because if you don't have uh, stability and like balance in your life, you can't create and we need your stories. We really do. So um, I would say um, that would be my main advice to like aspiring artists for sure. Um, in terms of the gatekeepers, like in particular, I'm looking at the publishing company and that's the, like the publishing companies out there. We saw that hashtag that sort of reveals the advances that white, uh, you know, our authors, first time authors get versus POC first time authors. Mm -hmm. right. we, we can see what's happening. You know, it's like you need to investigate where this money, you know, where the money is coming from and what you value, what you put your money in. Like, I know that they uh, give advances to stuff that they think will sell. I feel like the gatekeepers need to examine their biases and like uh, expand what they read, expand uh, what they listen, what stories they listen to just in their daily life. Um, if you don't have that curiosity for other points of view, you can't fake that either when you hire and when you give contracts to people. So um, it's like work people up there have to do as well. Like people in power have to put in the work too, not just the people who want to break down the gates. Um, uh, but again, that comes back to, I keep saying curiosity because that, I think that's what separates a lot of people for me, I, I gravitate towards people who have a curiosity for the world and to evolve and change and, you know, understand more about perspectives they don't personally know. And, um, and then the people who don't, who want to keep the status quo are, are comfortable and they don't want, they're not you know, really curious about any other ways. Um, and so anyway, that's just something that came to mind. But, um, but yeah, I'm really excited. I think that there's a lot of potential in the future, but at the same time, I think it takes all of us to fight this down because I, I do see it as a battle. I see it as, um, especially in the U.S., but, um, but uh, it's, it's one that I'm very excited to be, to be fighting for. So, yeah. I just want, I wanted one, oh. one, one last thing uh, yeah. to, to off of uh, what Mia was saying um, about f having to find a, a second source of income or, or something uh, when you're trying to start your career or, or just working and living as a professional artist. I would tell any student or anybody that wants to do this professionally to be good at more than one thing. Like if you love painting dragons, don't call yourself the master of dragons and then that's it. That's all you do <laughs> oh my God. Right? because you're yeah. screwing yourself. And uh, you know, photo retouching, uh, some light animation, if that's in your, if, if that's your interest and then in your wheelhouse. Um, digital painting, oil painting, different types of working in different types of media, uh, being able to put a sketch or a, a little oil study on Instagram and sell it for a thousand bucks when it's, you know, a side source of income, you know, a thousand dollars, that's how, like, how, how, how many hours at a retail job or, or Uber, do, you know, do you have to do to, to, you know, make a thousand bucks off of a, you know, you, that's something you probably not, could knock out a painting in like three hours or something like that and sell it for a thousand bucks. But, um, you know, do what you love to do, but also be realistic. And if things aren't going the way you want, don't give up. You have to persevere. Like I could have given up so many times, but I didn't. I said, nope, eventually somebody's going to like what I'm doing and it'll happen. It'll happen. But until then, I'm going to go over here and be a concept artist. I'm going to go over here and do photo retouching. I'm going to work for advertising agencies. I'm going to work at this animation studio. I'm going to do all this other stuff and then work on my portfolio or find the occasional freelance job while I'm doing that and persevere. Um, like I, I've, I think me and I, and I have talked about uh, the fact that we're both doing Afrofuturism. Oh, yes. and so good. Afrofuturism, right? Is <laughs> in, like a niche within a niche of science fiction. It is. Not mm -hmm. everybody's looking for it. No, not, not everybody's asking for it or paying for it. Right? You got a lot of independent authors that are like, "Oh, we want. I want you to do my book cover, or oh, I want you to do designs for my independent film." And you say, "Okay, well, this is how much I charge." Oh, why so much, fam? My God. Oh, because I got to eat, fam. What are you mm -hmm. serious? <laughs> Is that a question? Like, oh, you thought I was just out here doing this just for free? Like, just because you see my Instagram page doesn't mean I'm just uh, like a hobbyist, just like, right. you know, working at the library or something. Come on. Yeah. But 
if it's if it's a niche within a niche of something, if it's something you're not seeing a lot of out there, you have to be realistic and say, okay, well, I need to be as good or better than the competition doing everything else or some of the stuff that I also have interest in. Otherwise, it's not going to happen for you. So that's um, real. I got I to gotta riff off of that too. So <laughs> this might make you a little happy, but like one of the, so I'm developing something right now with a friend, but in the future, I want to uh, pitch, if I'm still at Netflix, you know, I want to pitch to the adult animation side about um, a solar punk Afrofuturism. Yes. Um, adult animated series. That's not ugly. First of all, <laughs> yes. Oh my God, yes. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> but that, that there's that. So hopefully, you know, it, even in the animation world, there will be room and and a desire for adult animation that is black and beautiful and 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 really fun to watch and and heartbreaking and all that fun jazz. But um, something something that I think is really important for for up and coming artists to know is you know, the animation industry as of like two years ago to even today, like super today is that it's really starting to show it's, 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 it's bad side. Like we're really starting to see a lot of like people exposing other people for the crap that they have said and or done. And people are really getting called out for just being horrible people, which is amazing. But the downside of that is we've been seeing a lot of up and coming artists saying that they're afraid of coming into the industry now. And they're just like, oh, well, there goes that, you mm -hmm. know? And, and so, yes, this is an industry where there are microaggressions and there are unfortunately, you know, predators and really shitty people. Uh, but again, it's, it's a part, it's, it, it starts to fall in the new generation of artists that are coming in if you don't want to see that, if you don't want to be a part of that, then start helping us to change that by weeding out those people and 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 showing that you know this is no longer an industry where you know horrible shitty people thrive and and the nice ones don't you know so for for, for those coming in you know don't be afraid and be kind and, and generous because when, when I tell you that comes back to you tenfold, it does. It really, really does. And it's kind of kind of awesome. You're like, oh, I'm friends with who now? Oh, who's in my inbox now? What's going on? You know, mm -hmm. it's for those. But you know, um just don't don't come into the industry thinking you can take advantage of us because <laughs> we can will spit you right back out. Yeah, and that's that's something that I've been seeing happening, and it's and then and and be genuine. Don't be disingenuous. Don't apologize just because you got called out for something. You know, if if you really mean an apology, you're gonna apologize before people start. You know, exposing you and showing mm -hmm. your feats. No one gives a hoot at that point, and people are you know, just just be be honest with yourself and the people around you. Be open to change be open to being a better person you know that's that's what i look for in the industry for people who have been here for 10 15 20 years and for people who are like me who have been here for three four plus years you know and that's what i'm looking for people who are just coming in you know yeah all right <laughs> i believe that wraps up our panel on increasing diversity in creative <laughs> spaces i would say we covered the yeah, yeah, quite well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. That was awesome. But, yeah. So, <laughs> for those who are watching, thank you for joining in with us, and hope you learned and are inspired to, you know, take your characters, character designs, costuming, world design into having more diverse flavors. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we can just go down the list of, you know, just say your social media accounts, where to find each other. Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I don't know who's. So you can find me at Eric Wilkerson Art um, on Instagram. That's E R I C W I L K E R S O N. No K, no Q. <laughs> I spell people spelling my name all weird. None of that. <laughs> Just all right. <clears throat> and there you go. That'll lead you to everything else. I don't have a Twitter. 
I don't really like Twitter. I don't use it. Okay. Uh, but I have an Instagram that I haven't touched in a month. <laughs> but um, it's Macro Mushroom, M-A-C-R-O Mushroom. Um, I also have a Tumblr, which is Macro Mush, M-A-C-R-O-M-U-S-H. Don't ask. Uh, <laughs> but I really, I, I have taken a massive step back from social media. Um, and I don't know when I'll be returning to it. Um, and that's okay. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Once all comes first. <laughs> um, you can find me on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, uh, uh, Patreon, and Etsy on LAB Illustration. Pretty much everywhere. Lab Illustration. That's my initials. Uh, but that's where you can find me on all social media. Um, and I'm trying to be better about updating, but uh, we will see. But that's about it. Hey, we're in a pandemic. Don't feel forced. Oh, it's a uh, girl. I work full time. It's uh, yeah, I know. Oh, <laughs> it's all right. uh, we know that we know the struggle. <laughs> uh, a good struggle. It's all right. Mm -hmm. It's a good struggle. I'm, I'm blessed to have a job. Oh my god! Honestly, <laughs> every day. Every oh day. God, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then real quick, you can find my uh, work at artbymia.com with dashes between each word because somebody already had artbymia.com. <laughs> um, no. And then uh, my last name is spelled, well, you'll see how it's spelled, but, um, but you can just go like, look up my name on Twitter, Instagram, I'm on both. Um, and then I'm on Patreon and it's patreon.com forward slash my name. So pretty much. And yours truly is just art by Wu. Just find it. You might find a Taiwanese actress, but that's definitely not me. So <laughs> <laughs> art by Wu art. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, artstation, etc. But yeah, thank you for listening to our channel. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Bye.